Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Technion UK's 11th Ronorad Lecture and Dinner. I'm delighted to see so many familiar and new faces in the audience for what promises to be a very stimulating e uh, evening. This event, we want to take you back 30 years, when a young scientist discovered something in his laboratory that the scientific community was not ready or prepared to accept. That scientist was Dan Schechtman, now a Nobel laureate, professor of materials engineering and head of the Wolfson Center at the Technion. Dan, on behalf of everyone in the audience, I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening. The journey you have made as a scientist has been remarkable, and we feel that the best way to tell your story is in conversation with our other special guest, Eve Pollard, celebrated journalist, author, and broadcaster. Eve, we're delighted to welcome you too. On a sad note, I'd like to acknowledge two outstanding friends of the Technion who are not with us this evening. In May of this year, Alfred Dole Steinberg, a long-term supporter and governor of the Technion, passed away. And we are all pleased to see his wife, Gerda, here with us tonight. And just four weeks ago, David Breacher passed away. David was a fellow of the Technion, a trustee of Technion UK, and also a long-term dedicated supporter. Alfred and David will be missed. 2012 has been an auspicious year for the Technion, marking the centenary of laying the cornerstone for the university. Technion's pioneers had the foresight to understand that the success of a future Jewish state would depend heavily on its ability to innovate through science and technology. The most powerful natural resource at the time was the DNA of its people. Fast forward 100 years to today, and Israel is one of the technology powerhouses of the world. And where did the majority of those talented people and great ideas start? At the Technion. The Technion consistently features among the world's leading science and technology universities and achieves high academic ratings. It is a world-class research university, and now its three Nobel Prize winners is symptomatic of this success. At a global level, international companies such as Google, IBM, Intel have set up operations near the Technion campus, recruiting Technion's finest graduates. At the same time, the Technion is successfully attracting talented fellows, members from other leading universities throughout the world. It is no small measure that when the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, recently addressed the United Nations General Assembly, mentioned his recent visit to the Technion and how moved he was when he saw a disabled man, paralyzed from the waist down, get up from the wheelchair and walk up a flight of stairs with the aid of a robotic suit, an invention from Technion. That same suit was worn by the disabled Claire Lomas, who completed the London Marathon in a blaze of publicity. This is only one of many examples of what Technion does best. It turns out 70% of the country's engineers and 80% of the executive of Israel's firms listed on the NASDAQ. I invite you now to watch a very short film after which Professor Schechtman and Eve Pollard will come onto the stage, stage for an interview. Thank you. Dan speaking. Am I speaking yes. to Professor Schechtman? Yes, speaking. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Professor Daniel Schechtman at Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, Haifa, Israel, for the discovery of quasi crystals. Israeli film, people standing around waiting to wish you good news. You couldn't tell anybody for a bit, could you? <laughs> God here? Can you hear me now? I'm saying that was an exciting film. Very Israeli people standing around waiting to wish you well. No formality at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to say if you get frustrated with my questions, there will be a chance for you to ask questions at the end. Um, 
And I've had a delightful time with my first Nobel Prize winner. Um, but we'll talk about that later. But on behalf of everyone, welcome. Thank you. And shall we start with not what happened on October the 5th, but today we discussed what happened on October the 4th. October the 4th was just an ordinary day. There was uh, nothing special there that I remember. And did you not think that the price for physics was going to be? Or yeah. Well, uh, you know, for many years I knew that I was nominated for the prize in physics. But I never thought that I was ever nominated for the prize in chemistry. <laughs> and so I never knew the date in which they announced the prize in chemistry. And when the uh, October 4th went by, I said goodbye and let's wait and see what happens next year. Um, and that was that. So on October 5, I was sitting in my office uh, working on the computer. And uh, as you just heard, a uh, telephone uh, rang. And uh, I said, Medaber Danny, which means Danny speaking. He said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Please hold the line. Very important message. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> And then, and then the uh, committee, uh, chemistry committee, and you have seen the chair of the uh, committee, he changed this year, there's a new one this year, announcing uh, the prize. So he talked to me and then he said, you won the prize in chemistry? And I said, thank you very much. And then I said, and who is uh, with me on the prize? And he said, oh, you are alone. You are the discoverer. So this was uh, the beginning. And then, then, if you want to know what happened. I want to know about the money. <laughs> what do you want to know about the money? I'm just curious to know what you've done with it. <laughs> Sorry, it's in the G. <laughs> the money, <laughs> the money is uh, dedicated to education of my grandchildren, all 10 of them, and for my children, all four of them. Very worthwhile. We will have no more children, but maybe more grandchildren. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. I've only got five. So this is about the money. What else? No, go on. You were telling me. So then what happened? So then you get, you're told you've got this. Can you then, tell, you then can't tell I was money? I left my computer. That day was ruined as far as work is, is going. <laughs> and um, I was sitting at my desk, gazing at the floor in front of me for 20 minutes, thinking, what now? What's going to happen now? And I imagined scenarios of what is going to happen. But I was so way off. It's incredible. I didn't even imagine the edge of what was going to happen. And then 20 minutes later, by the way, they told me, don't talk to anybody for half an hour. <laughs> the, talk, uh, the call came at 11.15. And they said, 15 minutes before 12 o'clock, we announce. So for half an hour, don't talk to anybody. But, Hard. but I did. You did. So uh, I called my wife. And uh, my wife is a professor in Harvard University. And I said, are you alone? She said, no, I'm with a student. I said, well, I won the uh, prize in chemistry. And don't tell anybody for 10 minutes. <laughs> so she uh, told the students, to disappear, make himself scarce, and, uh, and she ran down to the computer center where she could see the announcement of the, uh, of the prize. And then she took a taxi to come to the Technion. Why did she not drive her own car? Because <laughs> I took her car that morning because my old car didn't start. So that's the way it goes. But now, now I have a new car. <laughs> the money. Um, no, 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 salary, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> shall we be serious for a moment and go back to when you discovered yes. quasi crystals? Shall we just, just okay. five minutes? Of it was 1982, it was April 8, 1982, a nice April day in the United States, in mm. Maryland. 
at a laboratory, at that time it was called NBS, National Bureau of Standards, a wonderful laboratory, excellent people, and wonderful facility. And I was working on development of a new aluminum alloys for aerospace applications. And uh, the alloy that I was studying uh, that day, which I have prepared a couple days before, was aluminum, which had 25 weight percent manganese in it. It's a combination, it's an alloy. And I studied it by electron microscopy. I was and am a, uh, a professional electron microscopist. An electron microscope is a large machine that sends electron beam that goes through a specimen, which is very thin, and produces all kinds of results under and above it, and you can analyze material in a very sophisticated way. And the resolution of a microscope today is below the size of an atom, so it's below one angstrom. Very, 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 you can see very fine details. You can see atoms clearly uh, today. On those days, you can also do that, uh, although not like today. Well, anyway, so I was studying this uh, material, and uh, at about, uh, I don't know, 9 o'clock in the morning, I see a diffraction pattern, which is something you can do with a microscope, which cannot be. And uh, it had a very peculiar rotational symmetry. Let me explain about rotational symmetry. Suppose you have a cube on the table. We don't have one. A cube on the table. You can turn it 90 degrees, whoops, and it will look exactly the same. And 90 degrees more, it will look exactly the same. You can do it four times, and every time it will look exactly the same. It means that that cube, if you look from above, has a four-fold <coughs> rotational symmetry. One, two, three, four. Four-fold rotational symmetry. A, uh, a card from a deck of cards has a two-fold rotational symmetry. It looks exactly like this as it looks like that. Right? These are cards. This is a two-fold rotational symmetry. I have seen a crystal in a microscope that had a five-fold rotational symmetry. And that cannot be in crystals. So I have learned when I was a student. And this was the common wisdom. And this fact brought about the, a, a dramatic change in the science of crystallography which is the science of crystal, which is a very important and precise science. And the, um, the change in, uh, the, in that science was a paradigm shift in our understanding of the structure of matter. The uh, people in charge is the International Union of Crystallography, uh, redefined crystal with a new definition of, of crystal, and really it changed a very important science and opened a new branch in the science in which hundreds and thousands of scientists around the world are involved. But it wasn't all plain sailing, was it? It was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. The convincing, well, the experiments were easy. I was a professional, but convincing people that we have something new mm -hmm. here, that was not easy. And uh, the objection and rejection uh, continued uh, for 10 years, uh, from 1982 to, uh, in fact, 12 years, from 1982 to 1994. So explain to us how that happened. You would write a paper and say, this is what I have discovered, and go yeah. on, please explain. Well, what happened was the following. Uh, I, I repeated my experiments uh, and did all kinds of things that I should have done uh, to see what I have there, uh, but only when I came back to Tehran in 1984, <coughs> did I find a person that worked with me. His name is uh, Ilan Blech. He was a professor at the Tehran at the time. And Ilan Blech proposed a model that could explain my results. And together, we sent a paper for publication uh, to a journal, a scientific journal uh, for the scientists among, uh, scientists among you. It was a journal of applied physics. And the paper was rejected and came back very quickly, like a tennis ball from a wall. One, two, and it was back in my hands. And uh, with a letter saying that uh, this uh, paper will not interest the community of physicists, why don't you send it to a metallurgical journal? Which I did. And it was published, accepted and published. But it was published more than half a year later. In the meantime, 
1984 in the summer, I went back to NBS, met my colleague and host at the time, John Kahn, and uh, he proposed to send a quick publication, so I joined him and another fellow from uh, France, Denis Gratias, and the four of us, Schertman, Blech, Gratias, Kahn, wrote a second paper, and that was published very quickly, right after we, we sent it. And when that was published in November of 1984, then hell broke loose, because all over the world, uh, many eminent young scientists started to uh, repeat my experiments. I explained in the paper how to prepare the specimens. Repeated my experiments, and uh, in no time, a community of scientists, which were mathematicians, physicists, chemists, material scientists, and more, started to develop the field. So we all took my discovery and made it into a science. Now, one particular scientist was very against your discovery. Yeah. Um, there were a few of them, but one is famous. Um, that one famous person is uh, Professor Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was uh, probably the most eminent chemist of the 20th century, definitely in the United States. He was number one, admired by millions, and rightly so, because he really, he really produced tremendous chemistry and, and wrote the books. But uh, the man was, uh, mm, he was not modest. And he thought he understood and knew better about crystallography, and he was wrong. <laughs> so. He said some pretty nasty things, didn't he? Well, he, I don't know whether it's nasty. I look at it uh, <laughs> as, as, a, as a funny joke. He was, uh, you know, uh, Lannis Pauling was a very flamboyant speaker, really a flamboyant speaker. And uh, he stood on stages waving hands saying, Danny Schechtman is talking nonsense. Well, no, quasi-crystal, just quasi-scientists. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is the model that will explain his result. And he pulled up from under the, the podium a model of atoms connected with uh, sticks and you take this and you twin it here and here and here, chop, 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 and this and then you'll get Danny Schechtman's results. You don't need any quasi-periodicity. Periodic crystals are enough. And he was wrong, time and again. And by that time, I was not alone. You see, in the first two years, I was alone. Suffered rejection. I was uh, going to say, how did you part. feel? Yeah. Well, let me, let me just finish and I'll answer your sure. question. And so, uh, the fact that he stood on stages and, and spoke to large crowds, and uh, you know, I, I felt sorry for the man. I felt sorry that such an eminent scientist is talking nonsense. And I was not alone. By that time, we were a community. <laughs> the, the field was, had uh, thousands of articles already. The field was strong, and the scientists were Excellent, and he is standing there. Anyway, 1994 he died. That was the end of rejection. What was your question? <laughs> did he ever apologize? Did he ever change his mind? No, uh, no. I can tell you only one thing, that uh, before he died, uh, maybe a couple of years before he died, he wrote me a letter. Remember letters, stamp envelopes? <laughs> Um, and the letter said something like that, uh, Professor Schechtman, let me propose to you to write together the schechtman polling paper on quasi-periodic materials. And you will be the first, he said, he wrote. And uh, I answered him, Professor Polling, I'll be honored to write this paper with you, but before we even start, we have to agree that quasi-periodic materials do exist. He wrote me a letter back and said, uh, it, it's, the letter said, well, Maybe it is too early for that. And then, then he died, and that was that. That was interesting. Now, for those of us who don't understand quasi-crystals, <coughs> tell us what you can practically use them for. I mean, yeah, well, quasi-crystals are basically intermetallic, intermetallic compounds. These are 
compounds that are made of two or three elements, very simple elements, iron, uh, aluminum, nickel, chromium, titanium, simple useful elements, and, uh, they, but they have a special structure. The atomic arrangement in them is different, and that affects the properties. So properties of quasi-periodic materials differ from properties of periodic materials in certain ways. And uh, the applications that you asked about, there are a few applications, but let me give you a broader vision of applications of materials. Usually, it takes many years to apply new materials. And here is an example. When I did my postdoc in, uh, in 1972, this is uh, 40 years ago, I started my postdoc, and I worked for the US Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the United States. They had a wonderful research laboratory there. It's a very tiny little university where I could do my research. I worked on the development of materials called titanium aluminides. It's a combination of titanium and aluminum in view that these materials will be useful for jet engines of airplanes. This was 40 years ago. I wrote the first papers on these materials, explained how they deform. A month ago, I received email from a colleague saying, Danny, now they are in jet engines. It took 40 years. And I don't know how many millions of dollars invested in that project. 40 years. And the materials were ready. I had them in my hands. 40 years. So it takes a long time to apply materials. Let's go back to your question now. There are several applications to quasi-periodic materials. Applications depend on properties. If you have a property of a material which is unique and, and excellent and very good, then you can find some application for it. And let me tell you about some, some properties of these quasi-periodic materials. They, without going to details, they have interesting electrical properties, heat conductivity properties, <coughs> magnetic properties, optical properties. They have quite a few interesting properties. They have low surface energy. That means that these materials have low friction low coefficient of friction. Things will slide on them with, with little friction. Also, there are non-stick materials. So you can coat a frying pan with these materials, and you can make your, uh, I was going to say filet mignon, but that's not kosher, omelet. <laughs> uh, and uh, you can make an omelet, and it doesn't, it will not stick. It's like Teflon. But unlike Teflon, you can, you can cut your omelet uh, in, the, uh, in the frying pan with a knife. I wouldn't do that because it will harm the knife. So, <laughs> so uh, this is one application. Uh, there, is, um, there is a wonderful steel that uh, a company named Sandvik in Sweden makes. And that steel, many men use it. And many surgeons use that steel. Anytime uh, a steel has to touch the body, such in a surgery con situation, or when men shave with the, razor, with the uh, electric uh, shavers, uh, the parts that touch the body, the metal that touches the body, is made of that steel. It's, it's a wonderful, extremely strong, extremely hard, very malleable, it's ductile. So, and, and the reason it is like that is that it is strengthened by tiny little particles which are quasi-periodic. So here's another application. Uh, in the chemical industry, there are other applications. Okay, so people are looking all the time, saying, Absolutely. how can the electric car they electric cars. Aren't they using electric cars? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bunsen burners and I were never very close. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> we're going to tell jokes in a minute. We decided we were going to do that. Um, so the scientific community has totally accepted this, and they are now looking for ways to make it yeah, work. To, yeah, and, and we also make... Uh, the community makes new discoveries uh, time and again. They discover new materials that have the same structure. These materials are very abundant. <coughs> These structures are very abundant. There are hundreds of different compositions that will give you quasi-periodic materials. They're very abundant. It's all over, all over the place, yes. So people are looking at different ones. And yeah, and analyze the structure, analyze the properties. There's a lot of work that's being done in the field. 
but you don't do that anymore. I don't have time to do, to do that anymore. Uh, this year is totally taken by my travels in the world. Uh, you know, I feel like, like a missionary with a mission to talk about the importance of education, to talk about the importance of science, to talk about the importance of technological entrepreneurship. So I like to give these talks in the world uh, in the hope that I can make some changes in different countries uh, on different issues. Well, you, we, we should talk a bit about Technion because yes. it's an extraordinary university and it yes. has now three uh, Nobel Prize winners in the last 10 years or so. Yeah. Why do you think Technion has this amazing ability to think of new things, find new things, yeah. win these awards? Well, um, you know, the Technion, uh, the laying of the cornerstone for Technion was exactly 100 years ago in um, 1912. Uh, that year was quite interesting, by the way. You I know, remember it well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How is Cleopatra doing these days? <laughs> My best friend. <laughs> so, um, 100 years ago, but they started teaching only in 1924 because it took, it took years to build and then there were some arguments about the language in which the technology should teach. You know, uh, there, uh, there were people who were saying, we cannot teach in Hebrew because there are no te technical terms in Hebrew. The Hebrew was the language of the Bible. So how do you say uh, a hammer in Hebrew? How do you say? Quasi crystals. Pliers, how do you say? There were no technical terms. Uh, so we should teach in German, they said, because most of the professors were from Germany. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, Hebrew proponent said, uh, hey, if we do not create the language, who will? We must create not only the science, not only the engineering, also the language. They won, and for many years, the Technion was called the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew Technion of Haifa. The Hebrew Technion of Haifa. Now, now the Hebrew is disappeared from the name. But uh, yeah, it's called now the Technion. Okay, so what is special about the Technion? Number one, Technion is, the, is dedicated to teaching science and engineering. We don't teach other subjects. We teach a school of medicine, a very good one, a medical school, like where we are now. And um, so we concentrate. We don't, we don't spread. We, we teach almost every engineering subject that there is. So we have more than 20 departments uh, at the Technion. The Technion has a tradition of uh, choosing, selecting the right candidates. And the Technion is a tough school. It is not easy to study at the Technion. And Israelis look for challenges. These are, it's a very interesting thing. Israelis look for challenges, they look for hardships. And I can tell you that when I was a student, there was a sign at the entrance to the campus <coughs> saying the Technion City. And somebody added underneath, a town without pity. <laughs> <laughs> is the name of the movie. There was a movie like yeah. that. Some of you may remember that movie. So it's a technical city, a town without pity. And a town without pity it was. It was very difficult. And every year, the 10% that stayed behind had either to leave the Technion or to take the same year again. You could not repeat one subject. You had to start from scratch, go back. So it was tough. But, but the result is that, that uh, the ones that survived, and it is true today, are very good people. This is one thing. The Technion supports research in a very nice way when we receive a new recruit, a new faculty member. The Technion will give him or her a very nice sum of money to build a laboratory according to a proposal that he or she have prepared, and that proposal is a part 
of the deliberations when we decide whether to take him or her to become a faculty member. So uh, there is a support for, for, for starters. So, uh, you know, in other universities, I travel around the world and I, I try to understand how things work. In other, in other universities, they tell me, we do not, I just returned from Korea. In Korea, for instance, uh, a new recruit is given nothing, but he's given 10 students for free. The university pays them for their tuition and so on. And if he, needs, if he wants to do it, he has to get the money by himself. And the Technon is the other way. The Technon, we give him or her a laboratory. We give him the money or her the money to build a laboratory, but we do not support students. So he will have to uh, get research money, and from that money he can support students. Both systems can work well. But uh, we are very selective in uh, choosing uh, faculty members. And it told all this boils up down or boils up to um, to success. Now the other thing which you touched on, which I think you could do brilliantly in this country, is you teach then new scientists about startups. Yeah. Um, do you remember that George Bush said the French had no word for entrepreneur? <laughs> That's right. And you teach entrepreneurship. I teach entrepreneurship. Um, let me tell you the story. When I was a student at the Technion, the message of the Technion was, you'll be so good that when you graduate, everybody will want to hire you. And I said, as a student, you will be so good that maybe you'll open your own startup company. We didn't have the word startup. You'll open your new high-tech business, I said. And uh, then when I became a faculty of the Technion, I went to one department of the Technion that should have taught that subject and talked to the dean or to the chair of the department and said, you know, we do not know anything about opening a new startup. Why don't you teach it to the students? And he said, oh, we are, we are busy. We don't do that. You see, in order to open a startup or to start a company, you need two things. Number one, you need to be motivated. And number two, you need to know where the stepping stones are and where the stumbling blocks are. And so I decided that I will teach that class. And in 1986, this is 27 years ago, uh, 26 years ago, but we, I just started the 27th year of teaching, um, I opened a class which is called Technological Entrepreneurship. And it is designed to encourage technical graduates to open startups. Sometime in the future, not necessarily when they graduate, maybe five years later, work for somebody, learn the business, and then open a startup. The class is large. It's between 600 students to 300 students, depending on the hall that I have been using. Up to now, I have about 10,000 10, engineers and scientists in Israel took my class. And they walk about with the chip of entrepreneurship embedded in their minds. So what do I teach? Uh, I invite uh, people to talk to the students. They are invited lecturers, invited speakers, and they are di divided into three categories. First are people who made it big time in the industry. They have built industries, but they started bootstrapping. They did not inherit anything. They started in the shack in the yard, or in the kitchen, or in the basement, and made it a success. The first speaker, 27 years ago, was uh, Steph Wertheimer. Some of you have heard of him. He is the father of entrepreneurship in the country. And this year I bring, uh, and every year I change them. I bring three new people. Sometimes if I have excellent speaker, I call them again. And, and you'll be surprised. In the 27 years, there was one person who said, no, I'm not coming. One. Everybody I call say, yes, sir, when do you want me? It's incredible. Israel is such a country. You can call the richest, the most famous person 
in the country. Of course, now, now they know me. But, but I, was, I was, you know, a lecturer at the Technion. Even then, I explained what I want from them, and they said, yes, sir. Not only that, the next year I went, uh, invited somebody else, and the secretary of that one called me, hey, Danny, when do you want my boss to talk to you? I said, well, you know, uh, this year is <laughs> full, and, and, uh, but next year, of course, and so on. So they really want to come. And uh, is, here is an anecdote. When, when I first prepared the course, I prepared some money to pay for their expenses. But uh, to travel to the Technion and so on, you know. And then uh, when they started to come with their helicopters, I understood. <laughs> it's not necessary. <laughs> In fact, they asked me, uh, can I contribute some, some money to your, to your class? And I said, no. I don't need any money, the Technion supports it, it's fine. How does it work? So, I bring first the people who made it big time. And then I bring young entrepreneurs who are now struggling to have their startup a success. And they tell about their problems. For instance, uh, one, one doesn't have enough money. Another one has enough money, but he cannot find the right people to work with him. Another one yet didn't do the market survey properly. And now he discovered, now that he has a product, they make it in Taiwan for one quarter of the price. Mm -hmm. Another one has a product and he, he needs to do the marketing. And he's starting now to do the marketing when the product is ready instead of starting in the very beginning to look for the marketing. So, so they tell about their problem and the student can identify with them. The last group of people are the professionals. What does it mean? It means I bring the patent officer of the country to talk to my <coughs> students, tell them what is, I, what is IP, what is a patent, or what does it protect you. Uh, I bring a lawyer that tells them how to register a startup. What, what does it mean, a limited company? Why you should have a limited company and not take the responsibility uh, on your own? I bring somebody that talks about market survey, how to do it, why to do it. I bring somebody that talks about marketing, and, and so on. These are, these are the, uh, the professionals. So the class is success. It's a great success. It is always full, depending on the hall. The right now, this year I teach in a hall that can have, it says 300 seats. It's about this, I don't know. It's a, it's a larger, a little bit larger than this. How many seats here, do you know? 300. Hmm? 300. So it's a, this is it. And it's full, like it, like it is now. And, uh, and my students are very quiet, and I explain to them that the speakers are not professional speakers. They are people who made it. They are not lecturers. They respect you. They come and volunteer to talk to you. You will respect them. And so when you enter my class, it's like a concert hall, like now here. Very quiet, people listen. There's no exam. I just want them to be there. It's mandatory that they will come to the class. And, uh, and what they do in the, during the class, they write a report of what they have learned. One page, just summarize the lecture, and when they go out, they leave it on my desk. I have a secretary, she takes care of attendance business, and that's that. I want exposure. I'm not going to have any exam, just exposure. So, and they are exposed, and it's, it's always the, the talk of the campus. You, you can hear young people say, oh, I can make it, I have an idea, and so on and so forth. One of the things we tell them is where to take money and where not to take money. Some money is good. Money in a, in, in a startup, it has, it has colors. Some money is good, some money is not good. And one of the problems we have in the world, and in Israel too, are venture capital funds, VC funds. Venture capital funds that want their money back in five years are bad news for a startup. We look for venture capital funds that want their money back in more than 10 years. Because in five years, a startup, startup cannot grow and then they force the, the inventors to sell it. And that's bad news because it cannot grow. I want companies to grow, not to not to be sold when they are premature. So venture capital funds needs, need to change. Around the world, this is a world problem. And they need to, to have more time 
10 years is by far better than five. Next. Have you ever written a book about it? Because we could do with a, an entrepreneur course, I would think, in the UK. In fact, in every country that I visit, I encourage each and everybody to open such classes. And, and I'm, willing, I, I'm willing to give them the recipe. Exact, I'm, going to, I'm willing to come and teach them what I do. It doesn't mean that what I do is exactly the best thing, but it works. And it's it has been working for 27 years. Fantastic. Now, we have many students here. Sorry, I'm going off on a different angle because of time. Were you a very good student at school? Was I what? A good student. Were you good I at school? I was a good student. That's a good uh, definition. But I was not the best. I was never the best. Really? And what does it take to be a good scientist? Curiosity. Like journalism, nosiness. Science is the ultimate game for adults. We play and get paid for that. <laughs> we play and by playing, by being, by having curiosity, what's going on there? What's going on there? By having this curious, childish curiosity, we discover new things. You know, Mother Nature, have, she has many secrets. And uh, she's hiding them. So and, uh, and we look for them, <laughs> like Easter eggs. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's a game. It's a game of the scientists against Mother Nature. Fair enough. Now, I have to ask you on a day like today, Israel once again is fighting. How do you think this will end, this current situation? I don't think it's a good question. I don't think it will end. Oh, of course, no. It will stop. Yes. For a while. It's not going to end. When uh, I remember asking my, uh, somebody asked my grandmother, did you finish cleaning the house? She said, no, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what's going to happen now, for sure. Um, there will be some agreement, and um, and then they will start firing again. Sure. No, I agree with that. Well, can I say how much we've enjoyed listening to you? Can I say that you have sort of been, in a funny way, your ghost has been hovering over my life because when I when I started dating, just before the First World War. <laughs> um, I had to bring boys home to meet my parents. Yes. That was what you did. My father desperately wanted me to get married, but it didn't want me to go out with boys. How I was going to... Aha. Typical Jewish father. And I would go out with them, and then my mother would say, why are you not seeing so-and-so? And I couldn't say terrible kisser or boring or anything. So the only acceptable excuse was to say, not clever enough. And my mother, with a sweet, slight Viennese accent, would say, what are you looking for? A Nobel Prize winner? <laughs> <laughs> I finally got there. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? Yes, we have somebody in the middle. Thank you. It would be nice if you tell us who you are. Um, hi, I'm Guy Livy. I'm a school student currently in my last year of school before going off to university. What advice would you give to a budding scientist? What advice to? He said, what advice would you give to a budding scientist? A budding scientist. Okay. Uh, here is my advice. Not only to budding scientists, but to young people in general. If you want to have a wonderful career, Become an expert in something. Find something that you like and become an expert in that. Be the best in your class, the best in your school, the best in your country. And thrive to be the best in the world. And I promise you, and every young person here, if you become an expert in something, you'll have a wonderful career. 
And I'm not talking only about science. You want to, you like playing the piano? Wonderful. Try to become number one. Anything. You know how to write poems? Tremendous. Try to be number one. Try to, try to get the Nobel Prize in literature for your work. So be a professional. But be a professional is something that you like. Advice. Thank, Thank you, please. Uh, Tony Grabener. Um, you've obviously been at the cutting edge from an Israeli perspective in all the work you've been doing. What is your vision of Britain in this uh, context? In other words, are we any good at it? How do you view Britain? And if we're are we any good at doing here what you've been doing there? And if we're not, what are we doing wrong? Can you read? Do you want to I, I don't hear very well. Is this it, is why she repeats it for me. Are, is Britain any good at doing what you do very well? And if so, what are we doing wrong? Regarding entrepreneurship? I think regarding entrepreneurship or science or... Well, if you could give us the answer to the entrepreneurship, you could come and be the Prime Minister. Tomorrow. But, but science would be a good start. Sure. Science? Science. I think you have wonderful scientists. Britain has wonderful scientists. Why, why do you undermine your achievements? You have wonderful scientists and wonderful achievements. I don't know, I, I, to tell you the truth, I know uh, scientists from my uh, generations, which uh, you know, they finished their studies with Pharaoh. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you have uh, tremendous scientists and, and amazing universities uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, don't undermine that. Uh, I don't know whether you have uh, a young generation that is so good as the old generation. I simply don't know. You may have that. I don't know, I don't know them. But, uh, you know, Britain was the birthplace of many sciences. Take, for instance, my, my tool, my t uh, research tool, which is an electron microscope. Electron microscopy, all the theory was developed here uh, in, in, in England, in Oxford and Cambridge and in other places. But do uh, Peter you, do you uh, let me mention a few names. Uh, Peter Hirsch, Archie Howie, Robbie Nicholson, you may know, some of them may know these people. Everything was done here. Uh, all the theory, all the books. So I think <laughs> Britain has a wonderful science. Uh, do, we, do we use that? Do we utilize that? Is that what you're perhaps saying in the best way? OK, that touches upon entrepreneurship. Uh, um, and uh, <laughs> you know, you need a few things for entrepreneurship. Number one is. Uh, there are, there are a, a, um, is a mental attitude. Uh, the many countries, um, people of many countries have fear of failure. People will not start something because they're afraid to fail. And in certain countries, if you fail, it's a shame on you, on your family, on your city, on the emperor. And therefore, you don't start because of this fear. I can tell you that in Israel, this does not exist at all. Yes, most startups fail. But the people start again. And in Israel, you find that uh, people will invest in them uh, willingly saying, OK, you will not make the same mistakes again. You have been through the process. You know what a startup is. You know what a company is. You know how to run a company. I like your new idea. I am investing in you. And your failure, OK, you have one scar. Fine with me. No problem. So there is no fear of failure in Israel, such as the one I find in many other countries. This is one thing which is quite important. Number two, you know, uh, engineers, in a way, are like lawyers, in the sense that lawyers produce work for each other. 
they sue. <laughs> engineers are also like that. Engineers also produce work for each other because when they build something and they, when they design something, another engineer has to design the components and another one has to design how to produce them, so they also produce work uh, for each other. So, and, and so there is, uh, regarding entrepreneurship, uh, it's, it's a spirit, it's, it spreads. It spreads like, you know, like music. Suddenly, the whole country likes a certain kind of music. Uh, I, my, my love of music ended with the rock and roll, but, but <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was eons ago. But suddenly, everybody likes something. And in Israel, everybody likes entrepreneurship. Um, and people talk about entrepreneurship. It's the talk of the town. Every young man wants to be an entrepreneur. I have a son who is doing his PhD in physics right now. But he's thinking entrepreneurship all the time. He invents things with his friends, and they design how to how to make it, and they, they want to open startups, and they are in this all, all the time. So what universities can do is, is copy my class, or even make it better, so that they create a critical mass of people that, talks posit that talk positively about entrepreneurship. And, and uh, the British people have a very inventive mind. I, you know, I know from the past that there so many inventions were made here. And still, uh, Britain is very good at uh, computer games, for instance. You know? You may think that this is not important, but there's a tremendous amount of money in that field. Yeah? And, and Britain is very good at that. And in, in, in other things like that. So, but, but universities, universities should teach their engineering and science students, and medical students too. These are the people that open startups, MDs, um, scientists, engineers, technicians. These are the people that open startups, technological startups. Now, I'm not against opening a barber shop. This is also entrepreneurship, but, but engineers should open uh, other startups, those that, that build the country, that build the economy, that provide added value. Uh, one more, I think, is what we've got time for. Oh. Um, Sorry. Uh, I will repeat well, your no, question. No, we'll, have two, we'll, have two. we'll have two. We'll have a gentleman behind and then we'll have you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alec Nakamuli. Ah. Very often these uh, small startups are taken over or sold to major corporations and it fails. The best people from the small company leave, the big company tries to impose their bureaucracy on it, etc. What advice would you have to make these acquisitions a success? Okay. You know, I talk to young people who have companies now in Israel, they can sell them for $50 million or $100 million. And many of them do that. And I talked to them before and I said, okay, you have a company that's worth $100 million. You don't need the money. Develop it. Okay, so you'll sell it, you'll have $100 million in your hand. You think you'll eat a different yogurt? What will you do with the money? <laughs> so have a vision. Develop it to be a billion dollar company. Develop it maybe develop new products. This is the challenge, okay? You will get great satisfaction from a growing company, more so than the money in the bank. You have the money already, regardless whether you sell it or not. It's yours, right? Don't sell, don't sell. So this is, why we, this is what we tell these people. And this is why venture capital funds can be a menace if there are these five years uh, demand to, to bring back the money. So I think that, that you should also, if some of you are involved in venture capital funds, have more time, give more time, let the business grow. One more. Uh, Thank you. We Here, sorry. Uh, the problems facing Israel education 
it would appear that uh, junior schools, 50% of the population do not wish to have free education. In fact, they don't wish to have education at all. How is it in such a society with a 50% fallout we're able to produce so many Nobel Prize winners? Where does the excellence come in? Well, let me give you my view. Israel does not have many Nobel Prize winners. Not at all. Let's look at it this way. Let's say that the number of Jews that live in Israel equal the number of Jews that live in the diaspora. The number of Nobel Prizes in the diaspora is about 10 times larger than the number of Nobel Prizes in Israel. 10 times, did they say? 25 times larger. It's very difficult to get a Nobel Prize in Israel compared to being a Jew in the world. So it's not so nice as it seems. Let me talk about education for a second. And let me, let me use global terms, not necessarily about Israel. Let me use global terms. In many countries, there is a law that uh, provides education for everybody. I'm sure we have it here. No. In Israel, it has a name, the law of what? Uh, free education for all, or whatever the name is. This defines the obligation of the government to give education to every child. But it doesn't say that every father and mother have to send their children to school. It should work both ways. Not only the government is obliged to give, to provide free education, the parents should send their children to school. Now, in England, that may not be a problem. But in very many countries, Israel included, by the way, people do not send their children to the government schools. They send them either to private schools, and in some countries, they sell them. Uh, they, they, um, they don't send them to school at all. They, they send them to work in the field or herd the, uh, the cows or whatever. Uh, the, the, the law should work both ways. The problem in Israel is that the number of the percentage of children that go to public school is less than 50%. Less than 50%. Where do the rest go? Private schools. And in those schools, the quality of teaching varies from excellent to terrible. And in some schools, very many of them, they teach religious studies only. Mm. No math, nothing, nothing but religious studies. They do not provide uh, the right education for the children to succeed uh, in their career later on, and their children will never find a job. They, don't, they lack the basic education. So this should not be allowed. And what I say in Israel is the parent that does not give his children basic education, we call it core classes which contains math and, and, and Hebrew and, and English and science. Such a parent is not treating his child properly, and he should be punished by law. And some people hate me for that. But I think that a country that does not want to commit suicide should insist that every child is properly educated. And this is true globally. I just want to ask Ronnie Lossos to come down to the thank you. So thanks. Well, what a fascinating and entertaining evening we've had. 
Uh, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to both of you. If I may start with Eve Pollard in the nicest possible way. Uh, you're bright, vivacious, multi-talented in whatever field you've been involved, journalism, broadcasting, fashion. You are at the top of your profession in each area and you're a, you're a role model for all the young people who are looking for what they should do in their lives and I think you can be well proud. Professor Schechtman. <laughs> Professor Schechtman, your story is the most fascinating story. It's almost the story of the wandering Jew who at each place picks himself up and has to start again. In fact, it reminded me very much of the, uh, the phrase, the English phrase, that if you uh, don't succeed, you tr pick yourself up and you try, try, try again. In fact, uh, the old words from the song where you uh, dust yourself off and uh, start all over again would be very, very appropriate in your case. We are extremely proud of you. We congratulate you on your work and we're proud of you and we're proud of Technion and we're very proud of Israel because I think, especially in these difficult days, I think we would like you to know that we are all Israelis, even if we live in the diaspora, and our hopes and prayers go with you and your family and your colleagues, and we support you through thick and thin, and we wish you well in all your endeavors in the future. As a small token of our thanks, and I hope I get the bags right, we have a little gift for both of you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, before we go in, a, an oversight. Although not a, a trustee or a governor, Leonard Eppel also passed away. He was a long-term supporter of Technion, and I would think it's nice to mention we will miss him too. Having said that, I think we will all ready now to, those invited to dinner, we can all leave. Thank you very much.